And I want to now introduce Greg Scarlatio, et cetera, et cetera. Turn it. Good afternoon. For residents who might not know, I'm Al Anderson, here today representing our planning group for foreign affairs talks. As you perhaps know, we decided to continue these talks in virtual format during the lockdown period. Today, we are trying something a little different to come closer to the experience in the auditorium. Following our speaker's remarks, members of our planning group will join me in a question and answer session with the speaker. It'd be Rob Warren, Walt Lundy, and myself. All three of us have some background experience in Korea. We aren't using masks today because each is in his own residence. But now to the speaker. We're happy to have Greg Scarlatto, Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea back with us today. The committee that he heads up is an NGO located in Washington, D.C. and is accredited by the United Nations. He's going to speak on the nature and the dynamics of the Kim Dynasty in North Korea. He'll also discuss the regime's fundamental strategic objectives, as well as the history and prospects of U.S., North Korea, and inter-Korean diplomacy. Greg will touch upon current inter-Korean tensions and the response of North Korea's or South Korea's Moon government, and then discuss the prospects for North Korea policy under a second Trump or, or Biden administration. I should add that Greg is a very busy young person. He, in addition to the demanding work of the committee, he teaches a seminar at the Foreign Services Institute uh, for something like 17 years. He has done weekly broadcasts in Korean, beamed to North Korea via Radio Free Asia. And each summer he goes over to Seoul and teaches at a university. Welcome, Greg. We're looking forward to your talk. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be meeting you virtually. You, uh, Rob Warren, uh, Walt, uh, of course, speaking of FSI, uh, Rob Warren uh, taught and coordinated that class for many years, and I owe it to him that I am his uh, <laughs> best to try and I continue to try to fill some big shoes there. Uh, it's an uh, extraordinary opportunity. Um, again, it, it's fantastic to be back uh, under these rather tough circumstances, and uh, it's great to be speaking to this uh, great group of great Americans, patriots. Uh, always a pleasure to be back. So thank you. Speaking of North Korea, well, I, I have had an opportunity to meet with members of the group and discuss North Korea, so uh, I will be going through what I would describe as the fundamentals a little bit more quickly. So it has been uh, more than uh, 30 years since the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and in the former Soviet Union. The Kim family regime of North Korea has managed to not only survive and outlive its peers in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe by more than 30 years, this regime has managed to accomplish two hereditary transmissions of power in the process from grandfather and founder of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Kim Il-sung, to son Kim Jong-il in July 1994, and from son Kim Jong-il to grandson Kim Jong-un in uh, December 2011. How was this all possible? A compelling argument is possibly that the people of North Korea have known nothing but totalitarianism. The um, communist takeover of North Korea in 1945, after all, Kim Il-sung arrived in North Korea in a uh, Soviet Red Army officer's uniform. So prior to that communist takeover that brought one type of totalitarianism to North Korea, Stalinist communism, 
Of course, Koreans had been under Japanese imperial occupation for 40 years, 1905 to 1945, another totalitarian political system prior to that for 500 years. And I don't mean this as an insult to the Joseon dynasty. There are lots of wonderful things about the Joseon dynasty, music, literature, but for 40 years prior to that, for 500 years prior to that, Koreans lived under a feudal totalitarian political system. So of course, Kim Il Sung combined elements borrowed from all of these totalitarian political systems and gave it his own spin, his own DPRK, North Korean Kim family regime touch. So um, very early on, Kim Il Sung realized that he had to deal with the so-called enemies of the revolution who are those who had been involved with the, the Japanese administration during the Japanese occupation period, landowners, entrepreneurs, people of religious beliefs. And of course, we, I'm preaching to the choir here. We all remember that the northern half of the Korean peninsula uh, was the cradle of the Korean Presbyterian Church. My own mother-in-law is from, from there, from Saryon, North Korea. His, her father was actually a minister, anti-communist. They had to come down south to run away. Her brother died along the, the road of escape to South Korea. Uh, the, the, the capital city of Pyongyang was once known as the Jerusalem of the East. Uh, Christianity was practically a, a way of life. You're talking two churches on every street corner. Um, Christianity and other religions uh, have been exterminated with extreme prejudice. Many believers ran away, many of them were sent to prison camps, many of them were killed. Um, of course, at the next stage, as other communist despots had done, Kim Il-sung proceeded with purging the enemies within the revolution, those he saw as a threat to his own grip on power. Beginning in uh, 1956, uh, he purged the pro-Chinese faction, the pro-Soviet faction in the Korean Workers' Party. Uh, he purged some of the, the local factions. Those purges have continued to this day. Of course, there is the purging of, um, of the scapegoats as well. Uh, revolution is doomed to failure and the Supreme Leader cannot assume responsibility for the failure of the revolution. They do have to find those scapegoats. One example, in late 2009, they came up with a confiscatory currency reform. Women at the markets of North Korea almost rebelled. They almost ended up with a rebellion on their hands. People were burning banknotes, throwing banknotes into rivers, which is a very big deal because you guessed the face of Kim Il-sung was on, on, on those banknotes. Uh, they found a scapegoat, Park Nam-gi, chief of uh, finance and planning within the Central Committee of the Korean Workers' Party, had the guy executed. Of course, under the watch of Kim Jong-un, hundreds have been executed purged, demoted, sent to political prison camps, including his own uncle, Chan Song Pek, Kim Il Sung's only son-in-law, purged and executed in December 2013. This is the fellow who was in charge of all exchanges with China. He had his own half-brother, Kim Jong Nam, a brother from another mother, uh, Song Herim, um, assassinated with a weapon of mass destruction, VX nerve gas at a very busy international airport in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, so of course, uh, the system has operated as a very ruthless system since the days of Kim Il-sung. As we all know, the Kims have not been irrational actors within the world of North Korea. They actually act as rational actors that execute a fundamental set of strategic objectives. Of course, strategic objective number one is regime survival. 
of course, all political systems try hard to survive, including ours. Of course, in this case, the problem is that this is a, a regime that, according to a February 2014 report by a UN Commission of Inquiry, led by um, Australian Judge Michael Kirby, according to that commission, this is a regime that commits crimes against humanity. The UNCOI, the UN Commission of Inquiry, further recommended that uh, these crimes against humanity be referred by the UN Security Council to the International Criminal Court. Of course, that is a very complex proposition. China, Russia, RP5, permanent members of the UN Security Council likely to exercise their veto. Um, our own relationship with the ICC has always been a troubled and complicated one, even more complicated under the current circumstances. The, uh, the second strategic objective um, is going to sound preposterous, but uh, although our work uh, as a North Korean human rights organization is, I'm going to say Wilsonian, and let's take the, the good parts of President Woodrow Wilson. We are all aware of um, the controversy at Princeton, Rob. Um, but from an IR theory perspective, after all, as a human rights organization, um, we are um, basically proponents of a uh, liberal view of international relations where we hope that we will finally persuade this regime of the Kim family to comply with the obligations it, had, it has assumed under international law and under its own legislation. In terms of understanding North Korea, I have to confess that I, I have the views of a realist, perhaps the views of an offensive realist along the lines of what Professor Mersheimer um, puts forth. Um, this is a regime that holds an absolute monopoly of power. It has no competition at home. The only competition to the Kim family regime is free, democratic, prosperous Republic of Korea, South Korea. For as long as South Korea is out there, the long-term survival of the Kim regime cannot be guaranteed because after all, there's the other Korea that uh, Al helped defend while he was there in 1950, 1953, the Korean War. 38,000 Americans gave their lives to safeguard the Republic of Korea and uh, Rob, through your work and the work of your father, the, the Han River miracle was accomplished. This astounding history of economic, social, eventually political success. Um, and as preposterous as that might sound, the Kim family regime understands that the very existence of the Republic of Korea in its current shape of, and form does pose a threat to its survival. Of course, they continue to try hard to develop their nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities in an attempt to what they see as uh, international relevance also in an attempt to create the capabilities that will enable them to execute their top strategic objective, survival. Um, of course, I, I run a human rights organization. I, I, I'm not privy to classified information, but all one has to do is look at statements by senior US public officials to come to the realization that by now, I think we do have a fairly clear idea that the North Korean regime is in possession of a three-stage ballistic missile capable of delivering a nuclear warhead to the continental United States. So the launch of the Hwasong-15 a couple of years ago, um, that was the, well, the latest major launch of a ballistic missile. They've launched many more missiles in the meantime, apparently those don't necessarily count. Um, but uh, that said, uh, whether we're talking to them, whether we're not talking to them, I think that by now, for the past three decades, we have learned that the North Koreans will continue to work on developing those capabilities. Finally, uh, they've always tried hard to drive a wedge between us, the United States, 
and our friends, partners, and allies in South Korea. Uh, these efforts are ongoing right now. Uh, we as a human rights organization and other human rights organizations are experiencing tremendous pressure and harassment from the Moon Jae-in government of South Korea right now. Uh, and this is one example of a major disconnect between us, the United States, and our South Korean allies, whom we continue to regard as a democratic, free, prosperous ally, friend, and partner. But what is happening under the government of President Moon Jae-in is that for the sake of appeasing the North, for the sake of an uh, ever-elusive rapprochement with the regime of Kim Jong-un, uh, the Moon government is cracking down on North Korean escapees and human rights organizations. They cut their funding. They uh, have stifled the voices of North Korean escapees. It's extraordinarily important to send information into the country. They have banned balloon launches into the country and two brothers, Park sang Hak and his, uh, his brother, um, very well known for their leaflet balloon launches into North Korea, these two gentlemen, who are from North Korea, had their office searched just a few days ago. They had their homes searched, their cars searched. Everything in their office has been confiscated. Their cell phones have been confiscated. And now they're being interrogated for eight hours a day, interrogated by the North Korean police. Uh, we're trying to help. We're trying hard. Members of the South Korean parliament despite the fact that the parliament is absolutely dominated by the progressive party of uh, Moon Jae-in. Some members of the parliament are trying hard, including um, National Assemblyman Taeyong Ho, who's a North Korean defector. He used to be minister, political minister in DCM at the North Korean embassy in London. Also Chi Song Ho, the young disabled activist who was invited to participate in the State of the Union Address in January 2018. They just had a meeting just a few hours ago, a meeting with the press and the Park Brothers highlighting um, what is going on in South Korea right now. So what I've got on my mind, I've spent a lot of time uh, working with friends and allies. We, we will have to get some of those North Korean escapees out of North Korea eventually because they're, they're not safe. So. Just to give you one example of how the North can create a disconnect between us and our South Korean allies. So uh, speaking of the uh, operation of the regime, uh, please allow me to engage in a shameless act of self-promotion. Our website is hrnk.org. If you go to publications on our website, um, you should be able to see a report authored by Robert Collins on the Organization and Guidance Department, the OGD. Now, of course, in North Korea, there are four fundamental building blocks of the regime. The inner core of the Kim family, the KPA, the Korean People's Army, 1.2 million men and women in uniform, 80% of them four deployed south of the Pyongyang Wonsan line, uh, poised to invade the south. And of course, the party, the Korean Workers' Party and the internal security agencies, uh, 270,000 agents, the North Korean Gestapo, the Ministry of State Security has 50,000 agents. The police force that also executes political police functions, uh, the Ministry of State Security, 210,000 agents, and uh, the Military Security Command, the guys who are supposed to keep an eye on officers, NCOs, everybody who matters in the military, 10,000 agents, so 270,000 in total for population of 25 million. There is an extraordinary, uh, an absolutely overwhelming level of coercion, control, surveillance, and punishment. Um, neighbors have to report on neighbors. Family members have to report on family members. Um, basically, people participate in weekly self-criticism, 
Sing Hua Tsong Hua sessions where they have to confess to their sins. There is a certain uh, religious element associated with the operation of the Kim regime. There, there are these godlike figures, the Kims, they've been embalmed and kept at uh, their mausoleum at the, uh, the Kim Susan Palace, downtown Pyongyang. Uh, they're dead, but their eternal leaders, especially Kim Il-sung of North Korea. There's heaven, the capital city of Pyongyang, where most of the elites live. There's hell, there is an inferno, the inferno of the political prison camps, 120,000 men, women, and children. Those are basically the non-believers, those who do not believe in the Kim family cult. So there are weekly ideological training sessions, mass. There is confession. Uh, during these sessions, everyone has to confess to his or her trespasses over the previous week. Uh, so the the quasi-religious nature of this regime is quite interesting. Um, that said, um, and keeping the four building blocks in mind and going back to Bob Collins and the OGD, if there is one agency of the Kim regime that trumps all, that is more important than others, that would be the OGD, the Organization and Goddess Department. Uh, this is basically a... Uh, Human Resources Department on uh, steroids. Kim Jong-il began preparing for uh, taking over leadership of North Korea in 1974. He had 20 years to prepare, 1974 to 1994. He realized that he did not have a power base, so he turned the OGD into the most powerful agency of the Korean Workers' Party. Why the OGD? Well, because they had the dirt on everybody else. They had the personnel files. So he turned them into an agency that calls the shots, decides who lives, who dies, who gets promoted, who gets demoted. His son, Kim Jong-un, had very little time to prepare, barely three years, not 20, unlike the father. He was only 27 when he took over. Um, Kim Jong-il, his father, was 53. So he had no choice but to assume the same model that the father had followed. He continues to be very reliant on the OGD. Of course, going back to the purges, one of the reasons why, why the purges have been so intense is that Kim Jong-un has been in a mad rush to create his own power base. So um, knowing what I know by now and having worked with Rob, with, uh, with Al, with our authors and senior consultants, I would dare say that whenever I see a story about tension between the military and the party in North Korea, I don't really believe it because the party is truly the ultimate decision maker. Within the North Korean military, unlike the Romanian military in December 1989, there is a military line of command, there is a security agency line of command, and there is a party line of command. Nothing happens without party guidance. Party guidance equals supreme leader guidance. This is the greatest strength and also the greatest weakness of the North Korean regime. Is their greatest strength because it has enabled the regime to keep a strong grip on power. It is their greatest weakness because they will always be slow to react to unforeseen circumstances. And uh, despite their, their PR, their public relations, we seem to be witnessing this now during the age of COVID. This is a, a country that shares a very long border with China, only 17 kilometers of border with uh, the Russian Federation, the rest of China. It's a country that's sandwiched between China and South Korea, both countries that have had COVID cases. The South Koreans have handled COVID remarkably. It's unthinkable that there would be not one patient, not one COVID case in North Korea. And yet this is what uh, the regime claims that is happening. Again, going back to our website, I apologize. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a very interesting insider article authored by a former, very senior North Korean official who defected and, and authored this article for us. 
explaining why it makes absolutely no logical sense at all to believe the North Korean government propaganda that there is practically no COVID in the country. Um, we continue to deal with the same conundrum. The North Korean regime has not given up those fundamental strategic objectives. And uh, of course, as a, a student and practitioner of diplomacy, I will never ever speak against diplomacy, especially while meeting with this august and distinguished uh, audience. Uh, there have been multiple efforts under multiple administrations to deal with the North Korean conundrum. During the Clinton administration, we had uh, the Geneva Agreed Framework, which was, uh, well, a, a viable and a very interesting model for, for tackling the, the North Korean conundrum. Regrettably, the, the North Korean regime decided that, well, the Geneva Agreed Framework was dealing with a plutonium program. They, they developed a clandestine uranium enrichment program, got caught eventually. Then we went back to a, a different framework under the Bush administration, the six party talks. That didn't work out either. We've had several attempts. Uh, we all remember Ambassador Glenn Davis, while he was special envoy for North Korea policy, he had a meeting with Kim Kye Gwan, then uh, first uh, foreign vice minister of North Korea. They had a deal on leap day 2012, some American assistance, humanitarian assistance in exchange for a moratorium on missile launches, nuclear testing. Two and a half weeks later, they announced a, uh, a missile launch just ahead of the centennial celebration of the birth of Kim Il-sung. They preceded the launch, they failed. In December the same year, they managed to place an object into orbit. Um, under the Trump administration, uh, we experimented with a tool that had never been used before. The summit meeting, there were three summit meetings between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un in uh, Singapore in Hanoi and, uh, well, okay, a shorter quasi-summit meeting in Panmunjom when the two met. Um, I think that those who were in the know from the very beginning um, knew that not much could come out of it short of uh, us, the United States, acquiescing to, uh, to North Korean demands. Uh, the, the conundrum, the, the big issue that we continue to face is that well, here in the United States, when we learn our conflict resolution, we talk about the, the ZOPA, the zone of possible agreement. That's where the two sides meet. There is there's no ZOPA with North Korea. Um, North Korea refers to the denuclearization of the entire Korean Peninsula, a term that we have regrettably adopted uh, in uh, recent years, over the past couple of years, uh, as this distinguished audience knows, there are no nuclear weapons in South Korea. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons, low yield tactical nuclear weapons were removed from North Korea in the early 1990s. Ambassador Donald Gregg, I believe, is the one who, uh, who proceeded with that initiative at the time was involved. Uh, so when, when the North Koreans refer to the denuclearization of the entire Korean Peninsula, there are no nuclear weapons in South Korea. What they really have in mind is the dissolution, the termination of the US-South Korea alliance, removal of US forces Korea from the Korean Peninsula, uh, and the removal of South Korea from the protection of our US nuclear umbrella. When we refer to denuclearization, what we have in mind is uh, CVID, complete verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. These days under the current administration, it's FFVD, full, final, verifiable denuclearization. Basically what we tell the North Koreans is that they have to denuclearize first in verifiable fashion in order for us to consider normalization of diplomatic relations. That, that's a, a really, really difficult task. We are dealing with a totalitarian regime that ensures no transparency. If we have no access 
to those vast detention facilities where hundreds of thousands are held, what guarantees can we have that denuclearization, even if they proceeded with that step, what guarantees can we have that denuclearization is full, final, and, uh, and verifiable? So we have continued to face uh, the same conundrum. It appears that uh, the North Koreans had very high expectations prior to Hanoi. Perhaps they were expecting a lifting of uh, UN sanctions meant to do away with North Korea's nuclear and uh, missile program and potential proliferation, also meant to punish the elites in charge of the development and proliferation of nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, weapons of mass destruction. They were expecting a, at least a partial removal of those sanctions in exchange for one nuclear facility, the nuclear facility in Yongbyon, of course, so it didn't fall for that. And from, that, from there on, there has been very little happening along uh, US-North Korea interaction and dialogue. Uh, in South Korea, of course, President Moon Jae-in has followed in the footsteps of his predecessors. First and foremost, the great Kim Dae-jung was the, the symbol um, and the driving force of the, the South Korean democratization movement. Noh Mu hyun the next progressive president of South Korea, of course, President Moon Jae-in was uh, chief of staff to President Noh Mu hyun So he has attempted uh, somehow in similar fashion to engage Kim Jong-un to um, find a way to achieve some rapprochement with the Kim regime. Um, I would argue that President Moon Jae-in is quite different from his predecessors. And I will again look at things through the angle of human rights organizations in the South and here um, under the late President Kim Dae-jung and under the late President Noh Mu-hyun, the South Korean government did not stop funding North Korean human rights organizations. Quietly, but steadily, they continued to support these organizations. President Moon Jae-in's approach has been very blunt. They completely shut down voices, defectors, SKPs, organizations, critical of um, the Kim Jong-un regime in North Korea. Um, this may be because President Moon Jae-in has placed all of his bets on this rapprochement with the North. This may be because President Moon Jae-in is desperately looking for ways to resume inner Korean economic cooperation. Um, but one would think that uh, a wise man who's a uh, human rights lawyer by formation, who has uh, a foreign minister, such as Foreign Minister Kang Kyung-hwa, with extensive experience uh, as a senior official of the United Nations in New York, you would hope and believe that this president and this government in South Korea will find the middle ground, will find a way to do both. After all, we all remember the, the trailer that President Trump showed uh, Kim Jong-un in Singapore presenting Kim Jong-un with these two alternatives. One, insist in developing these weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons. The end result is a big mushroom cloud. On the other hand, give them up. We will see a miracle on the Taedong River. Fantastic, outstanding economic development of North Korea. Yes, North Korea has great potential. It's a beautiful country, beautiful nature, spectacular mountains and seashore. North Koreans, despite decades of oppression and human rights violations, are a capable people with potential for uh, uh, entrepreneurship. But on the other hand, a, a human rights hellhole cannot turn into an economic miracle. And this is not only about uh, civil and political rights, it's also about economic, social, and cultural rights. After all, one cannot run a, a water and sanitation project right next to a, a political prison camp. So, of course, since the days of the Great Famine that killed up to 3 million North Koreans in the 1990s, many more North Koreans have relied on informal markets 
many more North Koreans rely on market activity today than they do on the public distribution system. And the development of markets has truly been a remarkable development. But on the other hand, on paper, if you look at the criminal code of North Korea, any type of entrepreneurial activity is illegal. One can be arrested and sent to a Kyoha So re-education through labor camp for up to three years for engaging in these market activities. There is no private property. Yes, it is true that a lot of people drive cars, trucks, taxis for profit, but they do not own property titles. These vehicles have to be registered under powerful government officials and the powerful government agencies. Yes, there is a flourishing real estate market in the capital city of Pyongyang. Apartments change hands for up to $200,000, and yet people do not trade property titles. They don't have them. They simply trade residence rights. The only things you own in North Korea are the things inside your home. So beginning with property rights and continuing with freedom of association, freedom of expression, and all other fundamental human rights and core labor rights, North Koreans really need that in order to join the international community in the 21st century in order to prepare for Korean unification. I will argue that um, moving forward, we will come to the realization that you know, perhaps well, strategic patience was an approach that might somehow make sense while we enhance containment, um, while we enhance information operations meant to deliver the truth to the people of North Korea and to tell them the story of the outside world, in particular, the story of free, prosperous, democratic South Korea, information that tells them the story of the corruption of their own leaders. This is an extraordinarily corrupt system, as I was saying just a couple of minutes ago, a system combining private entrepreneurship and market activity with totalitarian government control and bribery. Um, and perhaps the, the third important story that has to be told is the story of uh, the Korean peoples, the North Korean people's human rights. They have to understand that they have rights pursuant to uh, international human rights conventions that North Korea has adhered to, pursuant to the, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, North Korea is a UN member state, and pursuant to North Korea's own legislation, North Korea's constitution, also available in English on hrnk.org. Um, there are wonderful uh, human rights that are actually included in the very constitution of the DPRK, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of religion. It's only on paper and none of that is observed. So moving forward to a uh, Biden administration or a second Trump mandate, if I were to guess, um, I would say that it is very likely that we will revisit an approach that factors in human rights more prominently under either one of those scenarios. Um, a Biden administration would be very likely to return to the Obama model. We used to have a special envoy for North Korean human rights. Perhaps many of you will agree that we had too many special envoys, but if there's one that we really need that is the, the special envoy for North Korean human rights, we haven't had one since um, January 2017 when Ambassador Robert King stepped down. Um, under a second uh, potential uh, second Trump mandate, uh, perhaps we would come to the realization that these uh, hopes of enacting change through summit diplomacy um, are not very realistic. And again, perhaps we will realize that we have to go back to an approach where we factor in human rights more prominently. Um, an approach where the State Department and uh, the National Endowment for Democracy and others um, get more invested in information operations meant to empower the people of North Korea to enact change 
And by that, I don't mean violent change. I just mean moving forward, empowering them through information, an approach that will focus on um, maintaining and strengthening alliances with our key partners in, um, in South Korea and Japan, uh, an approach that will focus on, um, on containing the, uh, the North Korean threat and on deterring the North Korean threat through commitment to our allies and our alliances. Al, that said, I think that my, uh, my 40 minutes are up and I, I think I'm going to stop here looking forward to uh, hopefully a, a good and uh, engaging discussion. Again, I'm, I'm talking to masters of diplomacy here. My, my mission is difficult. I, I look Thank forward you, Greg. to your comments. Uh, thanks very much, Greg. And I'd like to lead off with a, a question for you. Uh, I think that a lot of uh, uh, qualified observers of the situation over there believe that uh, there just isn't going to be any real peace uh, without unification. And given that, and it's well known that uh, the Kim dynasty is determined that they will lead that unified Korea. Uh, is there any real prospect of, of, of peace that you can see in, on the horizon? Well, uh, it's um, truly difficult to make a prediction. I think that you're absolutely right. We, we need to get serious about peace through reunification of the two Koreas, but the only model that's conceivable, in my view, is reunification under a democratic, prosperous, capitalist, market economy-oriented Republic of Korea. Strangely, these days, we, we seem to be headed in a rather strange direction. We see fundamental human rights being curbed in South Korea. We see uh, views critical of the Kim regime being stifled in South Korea. Uh, we see the South Korean police conducting investigations of North Korean escapees for having sent information into North Korea. You, you sometimes wonder if, if this is going beyond appeasement. And you, you know what the claim is at that end, uh, Al. The, the claim is that uh, the true Koreanness is embedded in the North Korean system. South Korea is nothing but an extension of Japanese imperialism. This is the Korean state established by collaborators. Um, us Americans perpetuated the inequity of American imperialism. I, I wonder how far off we are from the day when Korean conservatives have again to protect the statue of General MacArthur in, in town. I know you were there, Al. I know you have <laughs> views on MacArthur, but <laughs> you, you, you get the picture. I'm, I'm really worried about this attempted rewriting of history in South Korea. The identity of South Korea, so National Foundation Day has been August the 15th, the day the United States of America defeated the Japanese Empire. And of course, on the same day, 1948, three years later, the Republic of Korea was established. Under the government of President Moon, they go back to March the 1st, 1919, which was, of course, an independence movement involving Koreans from all walks of life, very anti-Japanese. So there's this shift in attempting to define the identity of the Republic of Korea, not as it is, and the truth is that this is an ally of the United States, a friend that has, been, that has had a lot of help to thrive, to survive, Tens of thousands of American lives were sacrificed for that goal. So you see the shift of identity towards something else, the establishment of the Republic in 1919, not in 1948 under the American alliance, the us Rock alliance and, and protection. But on the other hand, of course, the Kims in North Korea do not like this March the 1st, 1919 business because Kim Il-sung had nothing to do with it. He was obviously only seven years old at the time. So it's, 
it's it, it's a strange dynamic. I would never go as far as as calling Moon a pro Kim activist or a communist. You know, his obviously his views are very left leaning. I think that so far what we have seen is that he continues to be committed to the alliance with the United States. Thank God. But he he's taking some steps that are quite appalling. You know, I, I had to report. Okay, you will post the, the, this video and that's fine. Um, some of our colleagues in South Korea are under pressure. A colleague of ours who has been conducting interviews with North Korean escapees during COVID, thank God, because he cannot go there, I'd have to spend 14 days in quarantine. Uh, she was harassed by South Korean police, believe it or not. And, and this is a project that's partially funded by the U.S. State Department, by DRL, the Bureau for uh, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. So we, we're coming very, very close to very serious friction, I think. And I wonder if this is going to, to, to ignite because of the way uh, dissidents and North Korean escapees are treated in South Korea. So I hope for a free, prosperous, democratic, unified Korea, that's what, what you fought for, that's what you sacrificed for for all of you. Uh, and I'm very worried about what's happening right now, in South Korea in particular. The North Koreans are doing their thing. But what's happening in South Korea, I think, is, is deeply troubling. Thanks, Greg. That's very informative. Now, I think it's Rob, it's your turn to pose a question, if you will. Yes, thank you, uh, Greg. I want to thank you for a good exposition. I certainly agree with your themes. I'd like to say that we have an unusual situation regarding the Koreas today. You mentioned early on in your remarks that North Korea has developed a ballistic missile, and then it has been fully tested, that's capable of reaching the United States, perhaps with a warhead. The question is, this is a very critical issue for the United States. The Trump administration has taken the position, they've had three summits now with the Kim Jong-un, and uh, indeed, uh, the one that was most important was the one in Hanoi that had a breakdown. And at that time, uh, Kim Jong-un threatened that if you did not resolve these issues within a year, that he was going to take some drastic steps, demonstrate a more sophisticated weapon. Now it's a year and a half after the Hanoi breakdown, and uh, you still haven't had this type of threat delivered. What is going to happen? We have a situation where North Korea certainly represents a clear threat to the United States. We've made no progress that I'm aware of in the Trump administration, other than exchange of love, love letters uh, to uh, slowing down their nuclear program and increasing their threat. What can we do? How do you assess it today? Uh, the threat is still there, Rob, and that is really the, the critical question here. They, they continue to develop those capabilities, whether they test or not, whether they're talking to us or not, simply because they regard nuclear weapons as a, the ultimate guarantee of regime survival. And of course, they've learned, well, I would say the wrong lessons from the Middle East, where you see uh, despots such as Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein who gave up their WMDs and ended up being, um, in Gaddafi's case, I'll say it's sodomized and killed on camera. If their advisor is next to Kim Jong-il saying, Comrade Kim Jong-il, Comrade Supreme Commander, look at Gaddafi, he gave up his WMDs, his nuclear program, he's cozying up to the West, maybe we should, well, I wonder where they are today. Um, so that's, that's a really tough proposition. For as long as this regime is around, I do not think they will give up those uh, nuclear weapons. I, I, I will take the liberty of quoting a great friend and mentor, Ambassador Bosworth, who was dean of the Fletcher School. I was uh, there on the student council when he arrived, so we had an exceptional relationship. Uh, he once said it in a closed door meeting. He, he passed away a few years ago, of course, I can say it. Um, he was the top diplomat, a really seasoned, talented diplomat in charge of negotiating on North Korea, a special envoy for North Korea talks at the time, he said it, the North Koreans will give up their nuclear weapons, quote unquote, when hell freezes over. And that's a fact. So what is there to do, Rob? Uh, good old Cold War style, uh, containment, deterrence, again, true commitment to alliances and allies, not nickeling and diming over little things, but true commitment to American geopolitical interests in the Asia Pacific. If we prove 
incapable of dealing with a rising minor nuclear power such as North Korea, what are we going to tell our Eastern European NATO allies, the Baltic countries, the Poles, the Romanians, about our capabilities to deter and contain the Russian threat that's ever present and, and ever clear uh, each and every day. So containment, deterrence, commitment to, to real information operations, not half-hearted efforts to mimic Cold War efforts that were once very successful. I was there, I was at the receiving end. So I really think that this is the only answer because they're, they're really not going to voluntarily give up those capabilities. In terms of inter-Korean relations, of course, President Moon and his government would be very happy if we granted some exemptions allowed them to resume inter-Korean economic cooperation because he's desperate. He has placed all of his cards on this bet. But I would argue that that cannot happen without transparency, without real people-to-people -people contacts, without the opportunity to actually change hearts and minds in, uh, in North Korea. Now, Kim Dae-jung was good about this, in my personal view. So th th there were two two aspects to the sunshine policy, Rob, and you know this very well. So there was an attempt to, to change the behavior of the Kim regime by bestowing aid, uh, economic cooperation, uh, investment onto them. That failed, that's clear. They continued with developing nukes, missiles, military provocations uh, in the NLL and elsewhere. But there was a second component of sunshine and that was changing the hearts and minds of North Korean people through interaction with South Koreans. This was the chocopie approach and I'm sure everyone in the audience is familiar with the chocopie. That's the South Korean version of the moon pie. It was given to workers at the Kaesong industrial zone established with South Korean capital, know-how, uh, managerial know-how and North Korean labor. They received it for uh, for dessert, and they were so popular that they would resell them at the, the, the open markets of, of North Korea. That, that approach, honestly, I really think did not have enough time to be tested. And uh, I doubt that, that that side of sunshine will ever have a chance to be, uh, to be tested again. Now, we all know our history, Korean dynasties tend to be very resilient. And uh, the Kim dynasty in the North uh, also seems to be very resilient. And they, they adapt. We, in December of last year, we published a report, Rob, on the, the information environment of North Korea. Of course, we send information into North Korea. We should be doing better in terms of content, technology. But they're also responding by employing new technologies, by developing new content, and by applying judicial and extrajudicial punishment to prevent their own people from accessing information from the outside world. It's an abomination that in the 21st century, they only have 2,000 IP addresses for 25 million people, but this is still ongoing in North Korea. Um, so again, going back to the big threes, information, containment, deterrence, Maybe I'm a victim of my, my own training in IR. I've had part of it here in the United States, part of it in South Korea, but uh, I, I, I doubt that we, we, we can see more imaginative approaches. Talking is great, diplomacy is great, and of course, one has to be prepared. Uh, if you are present there, ready to shake hands, I mean, you know this better than me, all of you, things have to be lined up and ready and prepared and technical experts have to have worked on the relevant issues. The, the two leaders, as unpleasant as Kim Jong-un is, I'll call him the, the other leader, um, the two leaders meet, but they cannot discuss the details of a denuclearization program because they don't know them. There's a lot of work that has to go into that. Okay, uh, thanks, Greg. Now, Walt, if you can on mute and show us, uh, are you ready with your question, please? It is almost incomprehensible that Korea, that North Korea is completely isolated, completely cut off from the real world with a country, the same language, 
the same heritage, the same people, just to the south of them, they have almost obtained a Western standard of living. South Korea, the Republic of Korea has made it. Even in the current environment, is there not enough leakage of information about the better life in the South? Is there no dissident element in North Korea that eventually, sooner, later, whenever, is there no opposition that can coalesce dissent? Why isn't there more evidence of it? Well, that is a, a terrific question. Uh, more information from the outside world has been entering the country. According to surveys executed by Intermedia, a company tasked to assess the efficiency of U.S. public broadcasting to North Korea, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, four South Korean stations, we fund stations staffed with North Korean KPs. According to these studies, the number of North Korean KPs, the percentage of North Korean KPs who state that they used to listen to foreign broadcasting, they used to access information from the outside world on USBs, micro SD cards, mobile data storage devices. That number, that percentage has been constantly on the increase over the years. Now, does this mean that the overall number of people who access information from the outside world has been on the increase? We don't know, we're not sure, but what we know for sure is that the Korean pop culture, the South Korean pop culture has had a powerful impact all over the world. South Korean soap operas, South Korean pop music, South Korean entertainment. And there have been times over the past few years when the North Korean regime had to crack down on hairstyles inspired by South Korean soap opera and South Korean culture. They had to crack down on those in possession of music or movies from South Korea. So clearly the regime is worried about that trend. Many more North Koreans today know more about the outside world, especially about South Korea. But they continue to live under this overwhelming control and coercion. They continue to be under overwhelming surveillance. Everybody watches everybody else. So the, the regime has been very good at keeping the lid on things. The other problem is that well, the, 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 the four of us have a better idea, the five of us, because Rosa is still there, the five of us have a better idea of how the Kim regime operates than people living inside North Korea. They simply don't know what to do. Even if they, 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 they were armed and out in the streets, they simply wouldn't know what to do because they don't know how the regime operates. Power is concentrated in the capital city of Pyongyang. North Korea has a loyalty-based social classification system called Songbun. There is a core class. There is a wavering class. There is a hostile class. The, uh, the, the elites of North Korea amount to probably about 10% of the population. Most of them live in the capital city of Pyongyang, up to about 2.5 million. Uh, any type of change, Walt, uh, I would argue, would have to be along the lines of the Romanian um, anti-communist revolution of December 1989. One would need to see a coup at the top, because it's only those at the top who know how the regime operates and how it can be taken down. This coup at the top would have to be legitimized and justified by a countrywide popular uprising. This is basically what happened in Romania in December 1989, as, as all of you know very well. This is what would have to happen in North Korea. There have been attempted coups. Uh, there is a notorious case in 1994 when two army corps uh, near Hamun, North Korea, 
officers from two army corps attempted a coup. They were caught, captured, executed. We have spoken with uh, defectors who used to live in the area at the time who said that they could hear the sound of machine guns late into the night, every night, night after night. That's how many people were executed. Again, that said, uh, that's, that's a critical point that you make. The people of North Korea need more and not less information. The Moon government is wrong to shut down vehicles that carry information into North Korea. Um, the South Korean government is now involved in efforts to persuade the people of South Korea that this is, after all, a normal place. It is not a normal place at all. It's very far from normal. And by shutting down these stories about the appalling human rights record of North Korea, we're really not getting anywhere. But I mean, what can one say when the Chinese have one million Uyghurs in concentration camps? This is the, the, the world we live in today. That said, I, I like to believe that it's not a quixotic effort. Uh, more information, I would hope, will, over the long run, empower the people of North Korea and, and help them get over this mental blockage created again by having lived only under totalitarian political systems. It's, it's the best we've got. Thank you, Greg. That's very helpful. And, uh, and thank you, my fellow questioners, for, for your uh, excellent questions. So, Greg, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you again. A great pleasure. Thank you. Best wishes. I know you will stay strong, healthy, and in great spirits. I, I look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Very informative. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Walt. Hey.